chapter 18, verse 1. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the porter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the porter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made out of clay was marred in the hand of the porter, so he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the porter's make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this porter? Says the Lord, Look, as the clay is in the porter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I would, I said I would benefit it. Now therefore speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning a disaster and devising a plan against you. Return now, everyone, from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. And they said, That is hopeless. So we will walk according to our own plans, and we will, everyone, obey the dictates of his evil heart. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Ask now among the Gentiles who has heard such a thing, a virgin of Israel has done a very horrible thing. Will a man leave the snow water of Lebanon, which comes from the rock of the field? Will the cold flowing waters be forsaken for strange waters? Because my people have forgotten me, they have burned incense to worthless idols. And they have caused themselves to stumble in their ways from the ancient paths, to walk in the pathways, not on a highway, to make their land desolate and a perpetual hissing, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and shake his head. I will scatter them as with an east wind before the enemy. I will show them the back and not the face in the day of their calamity. Then they said, Come and let us devise plans against Jeremiah, for the law shall not perish from the priest no counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Let us come, let us attack him with our tongue, and let us not give heed to any of his words. Give heed to me, O Lord, and listen to the voice of those who contend with me. Shall evil be repaid for good? For they have dug a pit for my life. Remember that I stood before you to speak good for them, to turn away your wrath from them. Therefore deliver up their children to famine and to pour out their blood by the force of the sword. Let their wives become widows and bereaved of the children. Let their men be put to death, their young men be slain by the sword in battle. Let a cry be heard from their houses. When you bring a troop suddenly upon them, for they have dug a pit to take me and hidden a snare for my feet. Yes, Lord, you know all their counsel which is against me to slay me. Provide no atonement for their iniquity, no blot out their sin from your sight, but let them be overthrown before you. Deal with them in the time of your anger. Chapter 19, thus says the Lord. Go, get a porous earthen flask, and take some of the elders of the people and some of the elders of the priests, and go out to the valley of the son of Hinnom, which is by the entry of Posher Gate, and proclaim there the words that I will tell you, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and kings of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring such a catastrophe on this place, that whoever hears of it, his ears will tingle, because they have forsaken me and made an alien place, because they have burned incense in it to other gods, whom neither they nor their fathers nor the kings of Judah have known, and have filled this place with the blood of the innocents. 
They will also build the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command or speak, nor did it come into my mind. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that this place shall no longer be called Tophet, or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter, and I will make void the council of Judah and Jerusalem in this place, and I will cause them to fall by the sword before their enemies, and by the hands of those who seek their lives, their corpses I will give as meat for the birds of the heaven, and for the beasts of the field I will make this city desolate and hissing. Everyone who passes by it will be astonished and hiss because all its plagues. And I will cause them to eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters, and everyone shall eat the flesh of his friend in the siege, and in the desperation in which their enemies and those who seek their lives shall drive them to despair. Therefore you shall break the flask in the sight of men who go with you, and say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Even so I will break this people and this city as one breaks a porous vessel, which cannot be made whole again. And they shall bury them in Tophet until there is no place to bury. Thus I will do to this place, says the Lord, and to its inhabitants, and to make this city like Tophet. And the houses of Jerusalem and the houses of the kings of Judah shall be defiled like the place of Tophet, because of all the houses on whose roofs they have burnt incense to all the hosts of heaven and poured out drink offerings to other gods. Then Je Jeremiah came to Tophet, where the Lord had sent him to prophesy. And he stood in the court of the Lord's house and said to all the people, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring on this city and on all her towns all the doom I have pronounced against it, because they have stiffened their necks, that they might not hear my words. Amen. It's a pretty grim um, picture, pretty desperate picture, very difficult picture um, that we just got. Now, um, this is one of the best known passages in Jeremiah. And uh, in fact, I think this passage has made it into songs. There are many songs of the same tune. We are the clay and God is the porter. So we sing this. In fact, this text is used to illustrate the question of our free will and God's sovereign choice. And uh, sometimes it's used to illustrate predestination, as um, some call it. Now, the picture is the clay in the hand of the potter. What does this sentence mean to you? I just read out verse 6 of chapter 18. I'm going to read it again. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. What does that mean to you? Does that mean that God as the porter and we as clay have no say in whatsoever what we become? Is that what God is saying here? No, it's actually the lesson is actually the very opposite of that, isn't it? So we need to read the whole thing in context. The lesson that God is speaking out of that experience is the very opposite. There is nothing fatalistic about God's choice, in fact. We get to choose how we respond to the hand of God on our lives. Invisible hand of God is shaping and fashioning each one of us and the nations and the people. And uh, God says, it's you who actually have choice to respond and God will respond in kind to our response. That really is the message that God was speaking through Jeremiah there. So we need to put that into context. Now, just like two people, when they're married, you have absolute freedom, but in regard to the relationship 
of the marriage, you don't have absolute freedom. You don't impose your complete will on the other per person in relationship, right? Otherwise, it's no longer a marriage, it is a slavery. So it is when God created us and God has entered into a relationship that affects one another profoundly, God has deliberately, if I can say it this way, you know, uh, restricted his freedom in so far as he has allowed us to express our freedom and our choice. In fact, of course, God has the last say in all our uh, dealings uh, with one another. But God is saying that I will respond in kind to your response, to my, my plan, you know, my kindness, my advancement, my uh, dealings with you. So that's actually the story that we are going to explore. Chapter 18, first chapter is all about uh, when clay is soft and malleable. When clay is a, is a hand of the porter and it is wet, it is not baked yet. That's what chapter 18 is all about. How you respond, how you cooperate with the hand of God as he fashions and shapes you. Now chapter 19 is all about afterward, you know, when we have already responded and had made a choice and we are baked, so to speak, after clay is hardened, then you cannot bake it again, you cannot reshape it again. Now, then the pora only gets one of the two choices. Either he can use it or he's got to toss it out, break it to pieces because, you know, the, the clay, the pottery is something that is so malleable when it's wet. It's so workable. It's a soft. Yet, once it is baked, there is no possibility of reshaping it. Right? So that's the story. Now, chapter 18. Chapter 18. You know, we all use clay, right? We are all familiar with it. I mean, ever since the human beings were on earth, I mean, in fact, we are made out of clay. And most of us live in a house of clay of some type, bricks, other type of clay. You all have tiles in your home. That's a form of clay. I mean, we use pots, we use bricks, we use tiles, we use cups, plates, vase, wash basin, you know, in your toilet, toilet bowls that you sit on. <laughs> it's all made of clay of various kind. I mean, we can't live without clay. We, our body is made of, you know, fashion out of clay as well. So most of us, all of us, in fact, we are very familiar. I mean, we deal with clay all the time. Bricks and mora. Yet, it is very interesting when you look closely, not two bricks are exactly the same. They're all different. Not two are the same. Some, you know, they're all the clays, they got their own grade. Some are more uh, malleable, some have high grade and the low grade. When you talk, to, I mean, Mia was watching some pottery things, you know, the clay is very, very important. If you have a grainy clay, the low grade clay, I mean, there can be acidic clay, can be alkali clay, there can be, you know, a wet clay, there can be dry clay, the one that absorbs water well or not, the one that flows well or not, there can be uniform clay and uh, this, pro you know, not uniform clay, all kinds of clays, even the bricks, not one cup is exactly the same as the other, right? We're all unique. Uh, so, what's the story is that the pora has the great say and great control in terms of what he makes out of clay, but his control and his craftsmanship and the outcome is actually limited to the type of clay that he gets in his hand. I mean, how many have uh, watched those, you know, those artists, what do you call those uh, people who are, you know, really good at their art and he goes into great distance to pre prepare the clay and then you you know you uh, prepare the, the heat and all that you go through it and after that you examine you know you make you do your best but many of them gets broken because it doesn't 
meet the criteria. I mean, you will have all the same, you know, heat, every, everything, all the process. Um, but uh, in terms of clay, clay might uh, contain some, um, some alien matters and it will just crack while it's drying or crack while it's heating up and so on. It doesn't yield the grade of the, you know, uh, the vessel that you want. If you want a crude, thick mark, a lower grade of clay is fine. But if you want to make a bone china, I mean, the, the beautiful vase, china vase, then you have to have a highest uh, grade of clay. It, it will not. So, um, so the pora is limited to the type of clay he gets. And that's exactly the uh, experience of Jeremiah when he went there to the porter's house. He sat there and he watched the porter making the clay and the wheel. There are, the, the word there is wheels. So there is a bottom wheel that is attached to the top wheel. The bottom wheel, he moves with his feet. So he turns it and on top of the top wheel, he puts the clay and with his hands, he fashions it. And he's working on it. He's uh, putting his best. He's trying to make a very high-grade vase, or, or, or you know, um, very high-grade, you know, arts, work of arts. But it just wouldn't work, wouldn't fashion, wouldn't shape in his hand as he uh, would have liked. So after a while, the potter gets frustrated. He puts the clay back into the lamp. Mix it again, and he puts it on the wheel, and now he's changed his mind. He's going to just make a, a thick muck or, or some, something that will contain dirt. Or in the beginning, for example, he wanted to make a beautiful vase, and now he's decided this clay wouldn't run in his hand. He's frustrated, so he will just make a toilet bowl out of it. So that's the uh, story. And then... God says, that's my word, that's my word, okay? And uh, the lesson is that, he, this is what he's saying, hear the word of the Lord, he says. Hear the word of the Lord, O Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. What's the lesson? It's not fatalism, nothing fatal about it, but the porous hand is limited to how well the clay responds. How much he can do, it is limited to the kind of response he gets from the clay. So that's the, that's the point. And it's very interesting here, there's a word play. Um, pora is yosa. Pora is yosa. To create or to shape means yasa. So as a pora, I created you. I am shaping you, yasa. But since you're not going to run in my hands, you are giving me no choice. My choice is very limited. All I can make out of you is some crude pot. That's all I can do. So now what I'm doing is I am fashioning, same root word as yasa, I am fashioning as a pora, a disaster against you. Verse 11 of chapter 18, see? So that's the word of the Lord. All of us as a clay in Paul's hand have a choice. The choice is we will all be end up being something that is useful to God. Our life, every human life will be used to illustrate God's glory but whether it is God's mercy or God's judgment, that's up to us. So we have a choice in that sense. Yet our choice is limited in the sense that all of us has to be fashioned into something. will either illustrate God's mercy or illustrate God's justice and judgment. No one has choice not to illustrate God's uh, glory in some way. God has decides, God's 
God is just. God would much rather illustrate his mercy through us. That's why God chose Israel, chose Abraham. But this generation of the people wouldn't allow God's hand to fashion them for such use. So God has decided to make a different vessel, vessel of God's anger, God's wrath, to dash them to pieces so that we can see and look back and say, look, if you continually disobey, then your life will be part of history to illustrate God's justice and God's righteousness and God's anger, God's wrath. So that's what just happened. This is exactly what Paul is saying. When you uh, go to 2 Timothy chapter 20, verse 21, he says, Paul is saying, in a house, okay, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 20, verse 20 and 21. His God is not a porter, he just picks a number out of a head and saying, okay, you will be vessel of mercy, you will be vessel of judgment. No, that's not what God is saying at all. He's saying, even if I pick you, to be the vessel of mercy, if you continue to run your way and wouldn't respond to my hand, then I'll have to change my mind. I will relent from the good I will do, and I'll bring a shape, a fashion, a disaster upon you. Now, even if I have called out a disaster upon you, if you respond to my hand, if you turn from evil ways and come back to me, then I'm going to change that. I'll relent from the disaster and I will send blessing instead. That's exactly God's point. As the poor, God will respond to our response to his hand upon our lives. Amen. So this is what Paul says. But in a great house, this is a God's house, house of God, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Amen. Immediately. So whose choice is it? It's how we prepare our vessel. It's our choice, really. We give God. God wants to make a beautiful vessel out of all of us. But we actually limit how far God can do with us. And then Paul goes on to say, flee from youthful lust and pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with all those who call on the Lord out, out of pure heart and so on. God is saying, you know, make sure that you get rid of impurities as far as it depends on you so that God can fashion out of you the best that he originally intended. So that's the point. So God is saying to Israel, Israel, are you not in my hand? You're in my hand. You think you're fashioning your own destiny. No. I, my hand is on you. I've tried to mold you many times into a beautiful, glorious vessel to demonstrate my mercy to the nations, but you just wouldn't. So now I'm going to demonstrate my judgment. So that's what happened. Now we can apply this truth personal on personal level as well, don't we? We can apply this um, on national level as well. I mean, when we enter into the glory of God, there will be many who are saved, will be weeping because we have not reached God's original intention as God wanted. Now, there obviously will be three levels. Those who continually resist God's hand to the end and get baked that way will have no other choice but to be uh, broken to pieces. But even in the house of God, there will be some for honor, vessel for honor, and uh, some who should have reached God's original intention, but they've only allowed God to touch them only a little bit. 
they'll have to have to live with that. So this is a very, very serious message. This is a prophetic message that God is speaking to all. And Apostle Paul is really taking out of this Jeremiah's passage and he's giving his own interpretation. You make sure that you possess your body and your life clean. Cooperate with the hand of God. Then God, uh, Paul is saying, all of you will be a vessel of honor on the day of judgment. You will exalt and glory. Of course, there is not one of us who has originally followed God's full intention fully, except only Jesus. We all failed in some way. So uh, Romans 8, verse 28, Paul says, there is a way in which God redeems our time, even though God will not give us back the years that's been wasted. There is a way that God actually makes all things work together for good for us. So that's really in, that's called God's mercy, God's faithfulness in his possession. God can do that with us as well. But it doesn't mean that we can have those times back. So there is a mystery in there, I guess. I can't really answer all of that. There is a way in which God redeems his time. But it doesn't mean all of us will reach God's full potential when our life is over. What was uh, Israel's response? Israel responded to God in verse 12, and Israel uh, responded to Jeremiah in verse 18. And their response is a very sad one, because they responded to God first, saying that that's hopeless. Hopeless. We will walk according to our plans. That's exactly what they said. They said, you know what? I don't want to be a clay in your hand. I've got my own plan. I, I've got my own plan for my life. I want to be shaped according to what I want to be. And uh, I don't want to depend on you, God. We will just uh, go ahead with our own plan. We'll be shaped according to our desires. We will be the commander and chief shaper of our own destiny. We will dictate our own destiny. And we will reach our full potential by our own plans and our own means. That's what they say. But guess what? Their plan will never work. They will never reach their destiny because have you ever seen a lump of clay shaping itself? It won't. It can't. None of us can reach our potential. None of us can shape our inner being, our soul, to what God called us to be by our own strength, our own means. This is a catch cry of humanism nowadays. Says, you know, we will chart our own course. We will be the captain in this ship. We will reach our own destinies of our own making. The best that clay can do is just settle down, sit there. <laughs> That's what most people who say things like that do. They just settle down in whatever shape and form, never reaching any heights of God's intention on the inside. See? Only person who can shape our inside, your spirit, soul, and body, and make it beautiful to the full potential of God's original plan is the Porah, God, who created us, who alone has the blueprint as well as hands that can reach deep into recesses of our spirit as well as the one who controls the speed in which our environment a wheel turns and shapes us, right? God actually controls with his feet, <laughs> so to speak, all your external environment, and he puts enough pressure on the outside as well as inside for you to respond rightly to the pressures, to the times and to the situations according to what? The Word of God. That's our choice. And when we do that, we get shaped beautifully on the inside. See, the, the, the clay is an amazing thing. You know, hand goes in, one hand goes in, one hand goes out. 
and then you can really shape the wall and you know when you look at it it's amazing i mean it's a lump of clay but it sort of rises to amazing height and then it goes down and it widens out and it, you know depending on how you you handle it that's god saying you trust me trust me i am you know putting my hand up and down inside out expanding it and then shaping it and my feet is just turning are turning circumstances you just get the right kind of pressure right kind of circumstances right kind of challenges in your life but if you will yield to the hand invisible hand of god inside outside i'll make you into a beautiful vessel that will contain the glory of god amen, amen. vessel of honor it's called vessel of mercy to illustrate the mercy of God and it says vessel for glory Paul says even though I'm just an earthen vessel guess what I'm containing God's glory God's precious presence in us and then we will reach God's fullest potential amen amen God says you Israel in rejecting my hand and saying you can shape your own destiny and chart your course what you have done is something so silly God is saying that have you ever seen any group of people rejecting cool flowing water snow-capped mountain flowing you know with pure crystal water and swapping it with a muddied water strange water that you can't drink that's exactly what you've done and uh, in Israel, I've been there as well, you know, on Mount Hermon, top of Mount Hermon is snow-capped mountain, that snow melts. And as it goes through the crack limestone with pores, it goes down and then it flows. It becomes the head of the Jordan River. As it goes through uh, the rocks and so on, it picks up a lot of mineral. So it's really good for the plants. And it's a cool water, very cold water, clean water. That's how the Jordan River flows out and saying, you've rejected the very source, mineral rich, clean, cool, ever flowing water. That is the head of the Jordan River. And you've just changed it with some strange water, like Dead Sea water that you can't drink. Those of you who have been uh, Dead, Dead Sea, there was a just, you know, I was warned, be very careful not to have the, the the dead sea water touch your eye or, or taste it because it's it'll sting your you know eyes like crazy it's just so dense with uh, all kinds of salt and small tiny drop small tiny drop just got on my side of my lip and i just wanted to know so i went oh <laughs> they're like throwing up right there <laughs> <laughs> it's not salt it's just all kinds of things that are mixed together are just foul you've just done that you've changed the cool flowing water with this water this foul water that you can't use for anything that's what you've done and God says when you've changed that when you've decided you are the captain of your soul and rejected my invisible hand to shape you you got off the ancient good pathway jeremiah talked about that before didn't he in chapter 6 16 good pathway there's a pathway of blessing ancient pathway you got off there and then you wandered off into a dead end literally a dead end spiritual dead end that leads to death that's what you've done you've got off the highway and you've gone off into a road that leads to destruction a cliff and then you just fall off that cliff in fact that cliff is called a place called valley of son of hinnom that's where you fall off and more about that and jeremiah in fact isaiah talks about that as well 35 verse 8 and 9 talks about the highway of holiness even a fool once you get onto that ancient good pathway that is a highway even a fool will be safe there will be no lion there and you will come and arrive zion in a way in a time that god wants i better hurry up i'm taking too much time 
And God says, this pathway that you've chosen, it doesn't lead to my face. It will only lead to my back. You will not see my face on that pathway. You only see my back because you're going away from me. You know, when somebody says, you know, when you see my face, well, how would you feel if I'm preaching like, like this? <laughs> Oops, touch. You feel very unwelcome, right? Um, so this is actually the face. It's God's mercy. God's face. When God says, I'm going to show you my face, it means I'm going to be gracious to you. You know, I'm going to give you favor. But once God turns his back on you, there will be no more help. The favor is called grace is called justice. Judgment is the only thing. So God says, that's the pathway you're on. So you better turn, you better turn. So um, that was God's, uh, 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 you know, God's warning. But they didn't take it. In fact, they, their plan was to reject God's hand, invisible hand, and then to destroy God's messenger. They wanted to shoot the messenger because they don't want to have God's invisible hand on them. So they said, let's all, we already got our own leaders, you know, it says uh, we've got our own priest, we've got our own wise people who will advise us, and we've got our prophets. We, we like what they have to say, so we'll just keep them and we will silence Jeremiah. We will just make Jeremiah disappear. You know, uh, that's what they said. So Jeremiah's prayer now turns. Jeremiah, who has prayed for mercy for years, many, many years. Jeremiah, who's been pleading and pleading and pleading and pleading with God. God, extend the time. God, change your mind. God, relent. God, show mercy. Show your face, not your back. Now his prayer turns because they have gone too far. They have chosen to reject God's invisible hand, not to yield to his hand, and to destroy Jeremiah. In fact, next chapter, you will see Jeremiah's ordeal, how they wanted to silence Jeremiah. They actually tortured Jeremiah. So we will uh, learn all about that. So Jeremiah's prayer now changes. They've gone so far, there is no way they can be shaped again. They cannot be reshaped. So what's left is now they are to illustrate God's justice, just like Pharaoh. That's all that is left to do. That's in fact what Apostle Paul is saying when you see Romans 9, verse 14 to 24. I'm not going to read it because of time. I'm going to hurry. But um, that's what Paul is saying. See, when God uh, called um, Israel to come out of Egypt, Pharaoh refused to hear God's word. See, God's word is God's hand shaping you. Who is God that I should respond to him? Who is this Yahweh, your God? So he hardened his heart. Do you know how many times he hardened his heart? Anybody? Seven times he hardened his heart. So what did God do? God hardened Pharaoh's heart. You want to go that way? Okay, I'll help you to go all the way. And Pharaoh hardened his heart twice more. And God says, okay, I'll really help you. God hardened Pharaoh's heart six times more. Altogether, seven times. <laughs> Pharaoh hardened his heart. God helps him to harden his heart. And then so what? So that what? God says, okay, Pharaoh, you've made your choice. I'm going to use you anyway but not to demonstrate my mercy. I'm going to use you to demonstrate my what? Justice, my wrath, my anger, my judgment. So the limitation of our free will is that, see, all of us will be used by God. That's the limitation. But the free will that we have is we either, we can choose whether we'll be illustrating, demonstrating God's mercy or God's anger, God's justice. That's the choice that all of us make. Right? Now, the next chapter, I've got sort of 10 minutes, the chapter 19. 
15 verses. Every clay, every clay. Now, this is now after that incident. God tells Jeremiah to take a flask. Um, this is a very interesting Hebrew word. Uh, it's the sound word. It's called bak bak. Bak bak. That's the Hebrew word, flask, bak bak. Why? It's got a, it's like a, uh, when you pour water out of the narrow opening, it makes a sound. Bak, 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 bak. So that's why it's called. Bak, bak. <laughs> so it's about between 10 to about 25 centimeters. We find many of them potteries in Israel, right? So they, uh, it's a typical water jar that contains like, you know, a couple of liters of water. When you pour it down, it makes bak, 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 bak sound. So it's called bak, bak. Uh, it, it could be the very thing um, that Pora. Um, has made from the last chapter. This Pora would have, would have wanted to make a beautiful, you know, jar for this display, but the clay wouldn't respond, so he just poof, mixed it all up and he made a bak bak out of it. You just contain water or soy sauce or whatever you want for, you know, Chinese dinner. So uh, that's the one. Uh, Jeremiah take it. And then it's already shaped. And God says, take it and take some of the elders, go to this valley, this cliff, and then you throw it there and break it and then prophesy. So that's what Jeremiah did. And, uh, you know, we are like a clay, right? Clay has a limited time to be shaped. Clay has limited time to be moldable. For a human being, I mean, clay is a beautiful picture of, uh, you know, our life. 70, 80 years. I'm malleable. That's why I can move, you know. My tummy can come out and go down. And uh, it's more out than down nowadays. But see, I'm moldable. If I think my shape is not good, I can exercise. I can mold it. Uh, I can carve it, you know. But the moment I die, my body stiffens. Um... And then it will, it will no longer be malleable, moldable. In just a few hours, you know, um, it will be, become stiff. So is my inner being, my soul. The moment you stop breathing, you are no longer malleable. God cannot shape you anymore. Human soul is like that. Once we finish breathing, once our spirit and soul separate from our body, it's like that causes, passes through fire. And your soul, your character, your integrity, your inner substance of who you are and what you have become is hardened. It's bait. And it takes on whatever shape. That's why it's so, this life is so precious. 70, 80 years. Every day, every morning, hand of God tests you. Word of God comes to you and it shapes you on the inside and outside every single day. And you have a choice to respond to every pressure, whether you will be shaped by the hand of God or you reject that hand. And uh, Jeremiah goes there and uh, he goes to the valley of this place called Tophet and then he prophesies. It's the valley of the son of Hinnom, because uh, son of Hinnom or Hinnom or one of those sons who made a lot of money in those days, bought it and then named it after him, like Trump Tower um, or something like that, you know, uh, you know, Hilton Hotel or something. And the gate leaning over the valley is called Posher Gate in Jeremiah's day. Why is it? Because at the bottom of the valley were filled with broken pieces of pottery deposit. Why? Because then and even today, as I said many times, pottery, once it's chipped or cracked and it leaks, it's impossible to fix it, right? Pottery cannot be re recycled once it is baked. It has to be broken to pieces, discarded. And uh, just got this quotation. It's actually my quotation. But <laughs> said, there's nothing as malleable in the making and nothing as unalterable after baking as pottery. So it is our life. 
it is your life, it is my life. This is where the place that had to be broken, they will just throw all these cracked potteries. I mean, once I tried to use the super glue to, uh, you know, glue the handle, but it just wouldn't last. It'll just break again. It's not the same. It's never the same. So all those potteries were broken to pieces and ground to powder right there. You know, that's also the place uh, where the Jer people of Jer uh, Jerusalem came secretly to offer babies to Molech by burning them on the fire. After Josiah, the altar of Baal and Asherah was broken down, but still people will come there because it's a dark place at night. You know, there's no uh, sun that penetrated the very deep valley at the time, and they will just go there secretly and burn their babies to Molech. Incredibly evil. And um, archaeologists have actually discovered in cuneiform texts certain instructions for offering sacrifice to astral gods on flat rooftops. Isn't that incredible? And God says, this valley that has shed so much blood, I will make this valley a valley of slaughter. And guess what? It was fulfilled to the letter when the siege came. In fact, just like Jeremiah said, it was horrible, horrible. You know, many people of Jerusalem, they were cooking their own sons and daughters and the neighbors, just as Jeremiah prophesied. And uh, Jeremiah's uh, lamentation of Jeremiah actually talks about that. A noble woman cooking their own baby, horrible thing. It just makes you sick. It was fulfilled to the letter. But when, some years later, after the destruction of Jerusalem, Jews returned to Jerusalem, and that Porsche Gate has changed its name, and it became Dung Gate. Why? Is it called Dung Gate? It's still called Dung Gate today, when you go there. Um, it's not that dirty anymore. It's because the people on the inside brought their dung. They didn't have the flush system, so they brought the things out and just threw things over the cliff. So they became dangue, all kinds of rubbish. When Jesus came, that word Hinnom became Henna. So he called it Gehenna. Gehenna, Valley of Henna. And Jesus used that place to illustrate hell. And in fact, the English Bible translated as hell. So 600 years later, after Jeremiah's time, Jesus said, in fact, in Jesus' day, they, there was a continual fire going there. And, uh, you know, in the people in the 1950s, David Posen went there and he could actually smell sulfur there. There was a smoldering fire there and the worms were not dying there to break down those rubbish. People just toss over that gate, uh, that land over there in that valley. Even to Jesus' day, Jesus says, where worms will not die and the fire doesn't go out, that's a place called hell, Gehenna. It's a place where the pottery, human souls, they have resisted God's hand and God's salvation to the last breath, gets baked into a shape that is totally unuseful, gets thrown over and gets broken to pieces and become the illustration of God's righteousness and justice. That is the place called hell. In fact, the hell was never made for a human being. It was made for Satan and his fallen angels. But the human being that resists God's hand to the last minute, dying breath, will have to get tossed out there. In fact, it's very interesting when you see how Jesus died we will study that very soon. In fact, this Sunday, uh, starting from this Sunday, Jesus suffering. You know where Jesus died? On the opposite side of that valley of Hinnom or Gehenna. Opposite side, on the hill. Jesus died on the hill, on the opposite side, overlooking this place. And he shed blood, he died. And then on the same day, Judas, who betrayed him, killed himself. Where? 
over that cliff of Gehenna, Valley of Hinnom. And he hung himself, and the Bible says, you put together acts and uh, you know, gospel account, the rope broke. So his body fell headlong, and then he hit the rock, burst open all his intestines, uh, just like a pora, throw the pot and shatters at the bottom of the valley. That's how he died. And um, um, with the 30 pieces of silver, you know, priest thought, you know what, this is not clean. So they called it a field of blood. It became a burial place. Today, they made it in a park. But uh, that's what it was at the time. And the uh, Bible says, Judas went to his own place. That's an epitaph of Judas. He went to his own place. And Jesus said, it's better if he would have never been born. So, God tells Jeremiah, after all that, Jeremiah, now go to the city. Now go to the temple court. What you've just done and what you've just said, you tell it to the people and to the kings at the temple court and prophesy. Why? Because these people have rejected my word. When somebody is rejecting God's word, it is the same thing as rejecting God's hand, touching them and fashioning them into the shape of glory, in the shape of the vessel that contain God's glory and mercy. So now God is saying, now I have no choice but to dash these people to pieces and dash this city to pieces. That's what will happen. So they will be broken. Ultimately, see, human destiny. We've got two destiny. We are the clay. God is the potter. And every potter, every pot, every clay will have use for God. It will demonstrate either God's mercy or God's wrath, God's justice, one or the other. And um, there will be nothing in between. And that's the picture of us. We say, that, Lord, you are our potter. We are the clay. So what do we do, Lord? Have your way. Have your way. We cannot fashion us, but we can yield to the hand of God, touching us on the inside with his word and outside with the things that are happening around us. How we respond to that pressure is up to us. And the most important thing is, guess what? What Jesus has done. See, All of us have res resisted God's hand. It's because Jesus died on the cross. All of us suddenly get mended. And the rest of our life, how many years, who knows, that you get, that I get, we allow God to, having saved us, continue to mold us and shape us in His shape. So I'm going to finish here. But uh, with uh, this, I'm going to read Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the letter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master prepared for every good work. Amen.